There are places where being who you are is a punishable offense. There are places where you might be sentenced to death because you chose to live. These places have many names, but the ones who flee have one. Refugee. And it is in the name of the refugee that Hyas has dedicated itself for the last 130 years. Created in the name of the Jewish people, for the Jews who fled Tsarist Russia and Soviet Russia, the Jews who fled the death camps of Europe, the Jews exiled from places as varied as Algeria and Cuba and Iran, four and a half million rescued and resettled so far. When they said, give us your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, we were the ones at the docks helping them breathe free. And we are still at the docks and the deserts and the cities and camps and lands where people no longer have a home in their homeland. Only now it's a farmer from Darfur, a shop owner from Syria, a family from Ukraine, a child from Colombia, a Christian from Iran, a gay man from Uganda. The 65 million souls who still wander the earth in search of sanctuary. Why? Maybe it's because being Jewish means you don't have to be reminded never to forget. Maybe it's because we are called in our most sacred texts to love the stranger. Or maybe it's because as long as there are still places it is a crime to be who you are, there is still a mandate for us to be who we are. Hyas for the refugee. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Kathy Egan. I'm the director of the New York Foreign Press Center here. And we're very pleased today to have uh, two speakers who have, uh, between the two of them, uh, multiple years of experience working on refugee resettlement issues. And it's particularly timely uh, for our briefers as next week we have the UN um, Summit for Refugees and Migrants. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you today Mark Hetfield, who is the president and CEO of Pius. Uh, interestingly enough, he began his career a few years ago uh, as a caseworker in Rome, uh, resettling Jewish, refugee, uh, Jewish refugees from, uh, Soviet, the, from the Soviet Union. Um, he's joined on the podium with Melanie Nazaire, who is the Vice President of Policy and Advocacy for HIAS, and she is also the current chair of the Refugee Council USA, which is an organization that speaks on behalf of other um, refugee um, NGOs like HIAS. HIAS, as may, many of you may know, is the oldest refugee assistance organization in the world, and we're going to hear today a little bit about the work that HIAS does in re resettlement of refugees in the U.S., uh, what they see as trends and work overseas in their offices overseas, <coughs> some of their advocacy, introduce what the, the um, organization is looking to accomplish, and their expectations for the U.N. Summit next week. Um, I would, as a reminder, a note that we will, uh, that the speakers are uh, speaking in their own capacity and don't reflect U.S. government opinion. And we welcome questions after the briefing. Um, when you ask a question, please identify yourself as well as your outlet. And with that, we'll turn it over to our speakers today. Great. Thank you, and thank you so much for coming. Uh, we'll make our comments very brief so we can go right to questions. Uh, I'll give an overview of HIAS and talk about the changes we've made over the last few years and uh, also a little bit about the, the summits that are coming up and our expectations for those. HIAS, was this, HIAS is actually the oldest refugee agency in the world. We were established here in New York in 1881 primarily to help Jews who are fleeing uh, pogroms in, in Tsarist Russia. And we have uh, been here ever since, uh, focused on assisting refugees uh, through the mass Jewish migration period from Eastern Europe to the, to the United States at the end of the 19th century through the beginning of the 20th century, through the uh, years leading up to and following the Second World War. 
uh, the mass displacement of, of Jews following the creation of the state of, of Israel in 1948 um, in, in that region and uh, the, the displacement of Jews in 1956 from Hungary, uh, from Cuba in 1959, and then uh, our next biggest migration was the mass resettlement of Jews from the Soviet Union from 1970 until 2000. Uh, but since that period of time, Hyas has undergone another transformation, which is we are no longer a refugee agency that resettles refugees because they are Jewish, now we are resettling refugees because we are Jewish. Uh, we resettle refugees and protect refugees out of Jewish values, out of Jewish teachings, out of the lessons we've learned in the 135 years that we've been doing this work. And we do it in partnership with the American Jewish community, as well as with the United States government and with the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Uh, we do this work overseas, uh, where we, uh, we're operating in about a dozen countries, where we do our best to help keep refugees safe where they are in their countries of first asylum. We then facilitate their resettlement if we cannot keep them safe where they are. And then in the United States, we partner, again, with the State Department, with the Department of Health and Human Services. We are one of nine re national refugee resettlement agencies uh, that work with with uh, our community and with the United States government to welcome refugees, to receive them, and to help them get started uh, in their new life. Um, uh, I always like to speak, though, about the history of HIAS in terms of basically uh, two phases. One is the phase before 1951, when there was no refugee convention, when there was no right to flee, there was no right to protection, and then after 1951, when finally we had a legal framework uh, to use to protect refugees who were fleeing. Uh, and this, this was obviously a critical turning point, and this is what we're going to be reflecting on during these two summits. But unfortunately, with the number of refugees and displaced persons now reaching over 65 million, the Refugee Convention is now not serving us well. It's clearly not sufficient. Uh, the, the international community needs to do much more. Uh, right now, too much of the, of the burden on protecting refugees is in countries of first asylum. It's in countries where refugees are fleeing to just by nature of, uh, of geography. Um, and the international community has not done nearly enough, including the United States, uh, to help make sure that these refugees find a solution to their plight and that these refugees are protected. So what, we, on the one hand, we're very excited about this summit, or I should say these two summits, the, the uh, meeting that the Secretary General is convening on refugees and migrants on September 19th, and the high-level summit that President Obama is convening on September 20th. Um, and there, there's never been anything like this in the 135 years of Hyas's existence where heads of state have actually gotten together to discuss refugees. It didn't even happen in 1951. So on the one hand, this is a tremendous opportunity. Um, but we really are hoping uh, that it will succeed, that it will actually carry us forward. Uh, that something will come out of these two meetings to create a new framework and a new approach to make sure that, that this problem is actually solved and the refugee problem is, is addressed humanely um, and does not continue to get worse and worse. Um, right now, we're, we're not so certain what the outcome is going to be. Uh, we have been trying to call upon states to, to declare their vision for the two summits. Uh, we, we are hoping that at the very least we can get states to remember why the Refugee Convention was created in the first place. It was to make sure that refugees are no longer trapped uh, behind walls, whether we're talking about paper walls uh, cr created by bureaucracy or we're talking about actual physical barriers that prevent refugees from fleeing to places where they can be safe. And so we're asking for states to basically reaffirm three basic principles in their in a, in a kind of vision for refugees. One is that every refugee should be able to access asylum from persecution. This is the right of every refugee 
under the existing legal instruments under the Refugee Convention. But the fact is states have made it more and more difficult over the years for refugees to access that protection. Second, we'd like to see every refugee be given the opportunity for a durable solution to his or her plight, to feel safe, to feel welcome, and to feel at home without having to wait years and years for a solution. This is a real problem now with the average refugee displaced 17 years or more before a solution is found. Refugees should not have to wait decades uh, to make themselves at home. Uh, refugees are a tremendous asset to society, as we've learned in the United States, if they are allowed to be an asset. If they're allowed to contribute, they will contribute. And finally, the third principle is that a reminder that every refugee, every displaced person, every migrant is entitled to the same human rights as everyone else. Um, refugees are humans, migrants are humans, human rights apply to everybody. Uh, and we have to make sure that refugees are not treated like second-class people, uh, that, they're, that, they, that their rights are fully respected, and that's an important reminder. So we're not asking for anything uh, new. We're just asking for a reaffirmation of the principles and a serious reaffirmation and implementation of the principles that led to the creation of the Convention of 1951. Melanie? Hi, thank you all for coming and thanks for your interest in the refugee issue. Um, I was just going to talk a little bit about more of the U.S. angle on, on what we're doing and how we are responding to the global refugee crisis. Um, Mark mentioned durable solutions. Um, that's kind of a U.N. term. But what it basically means is there are three things that can happen to refugees after they flee. They can either go home, they can integrate where they fled to, you know, just wherever they landed, kind of make a life for themselves there, where they can be resettled in a third country. So um, in terms of the durable s solutions, we've got 60 million displaced people in the world right now, about 20 million refugees, 40 million internally displaced. Um, what we've seen is the chances for them to go home are getting smaller and smaller. Um, there are very few countries where we can see in, a, in the near future that people are going to be able to go home safely. So that is really not... Um, an option right now, unfortunately. Of course, it's the best solution, but um, if people can't be safe, they can't go home. Um, second, for local integration, as Mark mentioned, countries, um, neighboring countries that neighbor the, the crises um, really bear the responsibility for taking care of the most number of refugees, and they're overwhelmed. Um, countries have, I mean, laudably done everything that they can um, with limited resources to try to help refugees. I think, um, you know, we talk about refugees as if they're something else, but when they're in your neighborhood and they're, you know, they need help, most people in the world will, will step in to try to help them. But school opportunities are limited. Work opportunities are limited. Um, Health care is limited. Um, th these are countries that oftentimes are struggling to find the resources for their own population. So this is a real challenge. So one of the things that we hope comes out of this is that the world commits to helping these countries. Um, not everyone's going to be resettled. More need to be. But in the meantime, a good outcome here would be if the world commits to providing more resources so that all refugee kids can go to school wherever they are, so that all refugees can get work permits wherever they are, because until those things happen, they'll never even begin to locally integrate. And then the third thing is resettlement. And we're really falling woefully short as a global community on resettlement. Now, we hear sometimes, well, you know, it's cheaper, it's easier, why don't we just help people over there? Well, first of all, over there, like where? Um, there aren't that many places where people can be safely um, assisted. Secondly, um, there are going to be people, there are going to be refugees that will never be able to be home and will never be able to locally integrate. Um, and there are many reasons for this. Some is because there's ongoing persecution. It could be because of their gender, gender, gender identity. It could be because they are female head of, head, heads of household that don't have um, you know, someone to take care of them and protect them. It could be because they have a medical issue. There are many reasons. It could be because they're well known, a, you know, a political activist, a journalist who can, cannot be safe. There are many, many reasons. So resettlement has to be part of the approach to making sure people are safe. Right now, there are very few opportunities for resettlement. Um, the U.S. resettles this year, increased the resettlement number from 70,000 to 85,000, which is important. Um, it's going in the right direction. But we are talking about the, the most massive global 
immigration crisis, refugee crisis, in, in many, many decades. So for the U.S. to say, well, we'll go from 70,000 to 85,000, that's kind of business as usual. I don't want to, I mean, they, it's, it was a huge effort. Um, and, and the State Department and others who were involved and agencies like ours who partner with the government to do the resettlement worked very hard to get to that point. Hopefully by the end of this month we'll have, we'll have gotten there. But given the scale of this crisis, it's just not enough. RCUSA has asked the U.S. government to increase the number to 200,000. Um, that would include some mix of resettlement slots, but also other means of protection, which could be family reunification or student visas or work visas or other things that would bring people to, safe, to safety. Um, and we feel that this, this is a good time for the world to do the same, that countries who have the resources um, commit to doing more because um, not only is it important for, on, for humanitarian reasons, I mean, the, the fact is, you know, the U.S. still has the resources and the ability to welcome many, many more people than it does. Um, but also because what it brings to our communities, there is no community that resettles refugees that hasn't benefited from it. Um, studies have been done, but just even anecdotally, um, as the governors across our country after um, the Paris attacks in November last year, we're saying we don't want refugees, never mind the fact that, you know, nobody involved in any of these attacks was a refugee, but that was the big response. We don't want refugees in our states. The mayors and churches and synagogues and others in the community were saying, no, we like this. This is good for our community. This revitalizes the cities. It brings tax dollars. We have new energy. We have new cultures. We have new foods. This is good for our country. Um, and it also brings new perspectives, people that come from other parts of the world that can, you know, teach us more about the world that we live in. So um, we think that the, the U.S. should do more and the world should do more for resettlement. Um, in terms of the politics here in the U.S., um, there's what you see and what is happening. So what you see and what you hear is a lot of political rhetoric. It's unfortunate, um, preying on people's fears at a time where, um, you know, I mean, the world is a scary place. But putting the blame on refugees who really have nothing to do with any of that, these are just human beings like everyone in this room who have left their homes because they can't stay there anymore, um, is really unconscionable. Um, we, we have a system, we have, we have been resettling refugees successfully, I mean, officially under our current system since 1980, but in the years prior to that, we've always done it. Um, and, you know, we're calling on the U.S. to keep doing it. Um, so what you see and what you hear on TV is different from the churches, the synagogues, the local groups that are receiving refugees in our communities. We are the largest resettlement country in the world. We should do more, but we're still doing a lot, and that should be recognized. There, is a lot, there are a lot of people across our country who want to be doing this. So um, I would say, in, in, uh, lastly, just the way we engage with our government, um, we are one of the nine national resettlement agencies, so we partner with the State Department and uh, Office of Refugee Resettlement to uh, welcome refugees when they get here. We're the ones who meet them at the airport. You know, our, our staff and our volunteers will come in, in local communities, bring them to their houses, get them set up, make sure they have food in their fridge, make sure their kids get to school. Um, so that's the work that we do, and we also engage in advocacy. We push our government to do more, but it's a partnership. Um, and I think a really fruitful one. We have a very good system. Um, we'd like to see it grow. So happy to take questions about any of this. Thank you all for coming. Yes. The M21 Paris. I have a very basic question in light of the goals of having more resources worldwide and get a resettlement. The past experience of Europe seems to be indicating the opposite. There was a growing popular, you know, if you want, uh, you know, uh, opposition to having more refugees. East European countries say no at all. And even in Germany, now they talk about the upper limit of 200,000. So, I mean, how, where's the source for optimism and for change? The, the situation is going to get worse in terms of economic and in terms of environmental refugees. So how do you cope with that? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do you want to start with that? Well, I mean, you're, you're right. This has been a challenge, and countries have not been rising to that challenge. Uh, and the, the fact of the matter is that refugees are going to arrive whether they accept them through resettlement or not. I mean, one would think that would be the lesson that Europe should be learning right now. Um, it obviously has not. Um, and our hope is that this will lead to an understanding that you can either have an orderly uh, refugee protection process or the current disorderly one. 
Um, and there need, states have to have kind of an, uh, a come-to-Jesus moment where they realize that this, this is necessary. Uh, the refugees are going to come whether, whether it's through an orderly process or not. But you're absolutely right. We don't, we don't see that yet. Um, we're not optimistic that this is going to start happening right away, but we're hoping this summit will at least be an acknowledgement of the challenge. Yeah, I mean, I'll just add from the U.S. perspective, um, it just seems like you have to have a crisis first, and then systems are maybe later put in place to, to deal with the, the migration and, and the refugee flows. So um, in the U.S., um, there was uh, migration of nor uh, refugees and, and asylum seekers from the Northern Triangle of Central America. We had a large number that came in last year or two summers ago. Um, and only now is the government starting to put a mechanism so that people can come in safely and in an orderly fashion, because that really is the only way to do it, to have asylum systems that are fair and that work um, and that are, that are done quickly. So that's one thing that certainly Europe would need to do and effectively. And the other piece is to have an orderly system so that refugees can be um, brought to safety, um, you know, as part of a legal process. Hi, I'm, I'm, I'm Anna from the Brazilian newspaper Folha de São Paulo. Uh, what exactly should we expect from the summits? I mean, what kind of agreements, decisions should be taken on the summits? Well, I'm, well, we know we've seen the the evolution evolution of devolution of the documents um, related to the summits. I mean, these these are consensus documents, so. Um, it's hard to say what's going to come out of that process. What we would like to see come out of the process is very simple, a commitment by the participating governments to protecting refugees, to a restatement of the commitment that was made after the 1951 convention to live up to those ideals and respect those, those laws, those international laws, because that's not what's happening right now. We see a lot more collaboration among states, but that collaboration tends to be towards enforcement. What we need is more of a system towards protection. Um, so even a simple declaration that that would be the intention of the international community after this summit would be a victory. Are we going to see that? I don't know. But that's what we're certainly pushing for. Yeah, and, and concretely, we're hoping that the resettlement countries, meaning those countries that are currently resettling refugees and those countries that have the capacity to but are not, will agree to resettle. Well, well, right now, for example, the resettlement countries are the United States, Canada, Australia, uh, the Nordic countries, Germany, Brazil is now a resettlement country as well. Um, it's a, it, there's a, about a, two dozen uh, or so resettlement countries that are taking refugees in a, in a significant number. Um, but that number is woefully inadequate. It's only about 1% of the world's refugees, and we're saying that really 10% of the world's refugees should be resettled each year. Um, and if 10% if of the refugees are resettled each year, resettlement can actually be used to drive toward uh, a solution uh, for refugees and to help countries of first asylum address those refugees who stay behind uh, to facilitate uh, repatriation and return. But right now, with only 1% of the refugees being resettled, resettlement is merely a symbolic gesture uh, that protects the lives of those people who are resettled but doesn't really have an impact on refugee situations. The way, for example, resettlement was used in the early 1980s uh, to address the Indo-Chinese uh, boat crisis, refugee crisis. Hi, Alexei Osipov from Russian Komsomolska Pravda. I have two questions. Could you clarify your today activities, just resettlement of refugees in the United States, or you have overseas offices, uh, some external activity? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, it's interesting that while, while Hyas was, a, uh, was a exclusively a Jewish refugee agency, um, for the first 120 years, as I mentioned, we were focused on helping people who were Jewish who fled. Um, since the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948, Jews all had a, had a choice. They could, Jews who were refugees could go to Israel or they could go to some other place. Um, and so we were focused on resettlement for uh, those 120 years. But since then, we have transitioned to being an agency that helps refugees no matter who they are or what they believe. A very small number of the refugees that we help have that choice. They don't have a place to go. 
So in addition to being a resettlement agency in the United States that receives refugees, that puts them in housing, that gets their kids in school, that helps uh, the families learn English and get jobs, uh, in the countries overseas where we operate, and there are about a dozen countries where we have operations, uh, we try to focus on making refugees safe where they are uh, because most refugees don't have the option of being able to be resettled. Uh, to, to only, as I said, only 1% of the world's refugees have that option. So we do some resettlement work overseas, but in the countries where we operate, most of our work is spent trying to protect refugees where they are and help them build communities where they are. But uh, let's be honest, uh, Jewish for many years, I as will stay as Jewish means pro-Israeli organization. Do you afraid, you know, the main sources of refugees today are Islamic countries. It's illegal to be Jew or it's illegal to open any Jewish organization there. So do you afraid kind of the antagonism or anti-Semitism in Afghanistan from Afghani, from Iraqi, Iranian uh, refugees that will apply for Hayas? Well, we, we, don't, we judge refugees only based on their persecution claim and their need for protection. Um, and, you know, we're careful not to judge or prejudge people as to what their, what their views are, um, because that's exactly what happened to Jews during the 19, 1930s. <laughs> right. They, they can judge, but we, we feel that our, our solution is that if we are there welcoming refugees, no matter who they are or what they believe, um, that's, that's, good for, that's good for them, that's good for us, that's good for their perception of Jews, that's good for our perception of, um, of, of Muslims or, or, or Arabs, people who flee those parts of the world. And, and they're fleeing, um, they are fleeing uh, terrorism, they are, they, they, all they want is to get on with their lives. Uh, they don't have, a, we find refugees don't have a political agenda. Their agenda is to get their lives in order and to protect their children. And so we help them do that. And we believe that by protecting them and by helping them do that, we put them in a better place. Um, it's, it's good for them. It's good for community relations. Yeah, I mean, I'll say that um, the, the refugees that we resettle are not looking for conflict. <laughs> they're, they're looking to just get their kids in school and go to work. I mean, our system is very, very much relies on self-reliance. I mean, it's a, it's a very American resettlement system. You are expected to get here. You are expected to go right to work. So, um, so that's what people are focused on. Um, they are not, they've fled conflict. They're not looking for more conflict. So that's one thing. And then I'll just tell a couple of stories that come to mind. One is that um, um, there's at least two, but there's the first um, one. There was a synagogue in, near, near where I live in Virginia that sponsored a Syrian refugee family and got all the, um, you know, got their house, got the furniture, got the housing, invited them for meals, invited them to the synagogue. And it's, it's a beautiful thing. It's, I mean, I'm not saying like the whole world's problems could be solved by that, but it can't hurt. Um, and then the third thing is um, I was on a panel with a Syrian refugee who was, give, was resettled in the U.S. a while ago. He was um, a political refugee fleeing Assad. And he, um, he said his whole life he'd been told that the U.S. was the, the, you know, the devil and Israel was the enemy. And then as he was fleeing from country to country in the Middle East um, where he really couldn't stay, he got word when he was in one of these countries from the U.S. Embassy just checking to see if he was okay because he was pretty well known. And he said it just shattered everything that he had thought you know, about the U.S. and then by extension about Israel because here's, we were affirmatively reaching out to him to make sure he was safe. So these are just one on, one story, one story here, one story there, but it, it, all I can say is it has to make a difference. Maybe it won't change the world, but in, it will change each person. And um, we've seen a history of that in the work that we do. I am Adam Phillips from Voice of America. Um, I actually had some experience working with refugees in Lesbos and other places, and um, I, I was told at the time, and I was surprised to learn this, that, that the term refugee is actually a term of art. It's sort of a legal term that can only be designated to somebody after they've gone through a legal process of explaining what happened to them and who they are. And I would say that um, sort of anecdotally, or in my experience meeting people in some of these camps, many, many, many of them were not necessarily fleeing conflict per se, but really difficult economic conditions, or they were very poor, or they saw no hope, and they just wanted to grab a lifeline to some place where they had a better shot at life. Uh, 
sort of a quality of life other than, you know, threat. And so I'm wondering if you um, recognize those distinctions in your work or to sort of spiritually underlie both of them. Um, and if so, what do you do about the others? And the sort of second part of that question is um, a lot of times you hear from these populations or places where some of these people get resettled, a lot of resentment about of them, not because they're culturally or necessarily xenophobic, but because they're also struggling mm -hmm. really badly. And I'm wondering if there's another sort of prong to your underlying approach that has to do with the economic and sort of political betterment, shall we say, mm -hmm. of the people who are already there so yeah. that these people aren't actually a threat and, and getting a free apartment when they're working their whole lives to get one kind of thing. Well, nobody gets a free apartment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no. So I just, I mean, maybe I'll just kick this off because you had a lot of questions in there that were really excellent and worth exploring. So um, in terms, I mean, in our international programs, all of our work is done both with the refugees and the host communities. So we're looking to foster relations in the local communities. Many times, as you pointed out, those local communities also don't have a lot of resources. But, but we do target our services, you know, to, to make sure that those things happen. And that's also a, a more of a global approach now to make sure that, because you're right, you don't want to have people that are both in dif dis dif you know, difficult cir circumstances treated differently. But um, there is a legal definition. I mean, refugees are people who are fleeing persecution. They can't be safe where, where they fled from. So we do have a, actually a very strong obligation under international, under U.S. law to protect them. Um, so the question is then what does that mean and how do, you know, how do we do that? But, um, but certainly all migrants have rights, uh, basic human rights that need to be respected regardless of whatever reason you're fleeing. Um, so we advocate very strongly that those rights are always respected by governments. They're not, but we, we advocate for that. Right. And the, the biggest distinction between a refugee and somebody who's not a refugee is that a refugee has the right to protection <coughs> from being returned to a place where he or she would be persecuted because of their race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group or political opinion. And so it is very important for countries uh, where countries do it or for the UN where countries don't do it to make those decisions very, very quickly, to decide who is a refugee and who is not a refugee. Because the biggest enemy uh, to an orderly migration process, uh, to protecting refugees who need it, is, is a backlog uh, where people are not having their, their claims assessed and, and the refugees are not being distinguished from people who really don't need protection from deportation. They have rights, but they don't have protection from deportation to their home country. And uh, all countries need to invest a great deal more in terms of having systems that are fair but efficient and can make those decisions as quickly as possible. And as Melanie said, it is very critical that whenever you have a refugee situation, you do invest in, in the host communities. Um, that's, there, there tends to be a, a rift between, uh, and this is in every country, not just in the United States, between development strategies and, and development programs and, and assistance, humanitarian assistance programs. The rift has been recognized. I know the United States and other countries are trying to address it, but it still does exist. And, and a lot needs to be invested in terms of helping communities that host refugees with their development uh, so that refugees can actually integrate into those communities and be part of that process, rather than giving refugees assistance to live within those communities and ignoring the communities that are hosting them. Uh, my name is Elise. I work for Swedish Broadcasting. Um, there are two meetings, uh, one on migration, refugees and migrants. There is a declaration already. Uh, so that's the, that meeting. And then the Obama meeting, co-hosted by Sweden, by the way, uh, on refugees and resettlement. And there are goals, 10% plus plus uh, for humanitarian aid and so forth. What else do you expect to come out? Because, I mean, you can see that um, there are two, um, or are they just kicking the ball down the road, or whatever you say in English? <laughs> <laughs> that's what we're saying. <laughs> um, well, I mean... I, I think what's most critical is the fact that we're now paying attention to these issues. It's hard with all of the, you know, the documentation that comes out and the promises that are, are sought um, to predict what substantively will come out of these. But the fact that we are all here talking about refugees um, and that the world is recognizing that we have to do something as an international community, that we can't 
deal with this on an ad hoc basis is critical. So already something has happened. Um, we as advocates will certainly be pushing this administration to the end of this administration to be doing um, all it can to, to, you know, to make sure that the, pro the promises that the president is seeking are met, at least on our side, um, and also to um, set the stage for um, increasing support in terms of resettlement and assistance. Now, these are not easy things, but this is what we're committing to. Yeah, and I, and I think we should be frank and admit that what we have here is we have a secretary general convening the first meeting, and let's be honest, he's on his way out the door. He's transitioning out of that position. We have a president of the United States who's convening a meeting the next day on refugees. He also is transitioning out of that position. Um, so it really is critical that there be some, a lot of institutional follow-up in both the United Nations and by the United States government to make sure that whatever happens at these meetings uh, does live beyond the very limited shelf life of the Secretary General and President Obama. So that's really where there needs to be some attention. Because this is such a historic opportunity, as we said, never before, uh, that as far as we know has such an event with with heads of state coming together to discuss refugees and migrants and we have to make the most of it to make sure it's not just a one-time event which is forgotten about when we have a new secretary general and a new president of the united states uh, thanks for doing this Haji Masur from writing for japan so, okay uh two uh number question and one non-numerical question what's the average cost of um having one uh, refugee reselled in other country. I think it varies by countries, but just give me a round number, please. And two, you, um, I think it was Mark who mentioned uh, you would like to see 10% of the uh, the stock, the total refugee, be resettled uh, per year. What, what's magic, magical about 10? Is this number reflection point that will make the total uh, refugee stock uh, go down? Uh, or just, just if you can um, educate us. And uh, third question. Um, you mentioned um, like two dozens of like a um, like a major resettlement countries that consist like one percent of the total resettlement of the total uh, refugee at this point. What, how do you describe the characteristics of, of those countries? Like is it like a or uh, the, from the sort of economical perspective, is this a country is like has a, like a different eth ethical standard, or this is a com country has like a high uh, per capita uh, relative to the other countries? Um, well, in terms of the cost, I mean, we've been asked that a lot, um, and it's very difficult to determine. Um, there are costs involved with, you know, the interviewing, the security screenings. Um, refugees that come to the U.S. actually get travel loans. They pay them back. Um, there are also immediate resettlement costs um, in terms of um, just the, the short term, getting people into housing, um, getting them, you know, enrolled within a, in a medical plan. Um, but studies have shown that over time, refugees actually bring more in economic benefits than they do in the, the costs of resettlement. So I wish I could give you a number. We've been trying to figure that out for a long time, but um, refugees need different services, so it's hard to really generalize. Um, some need medical assistance when they come here. Some go right to work and never stop working. So, um, so in terms of the number, um, I mean, we think that there needs to be more assistance for, for, for integration assistance and resettlement assistance. The U.S. hasn't increased the amount that's available for a long time. Um, but, um, you know, we make a little go a very long way, and refugees do actually econom economically yeah, benefit. Like there. Right, but you have to look at what, what are the costs, you know, including the screenings, the, you know, the interviews, the staff time, all those things have to be added up. But and then there's the government costs plus the private contributions to it. So right, it, it but is again, the benefits have outweighed the uh, the costs. Um, what were some of the other questions? The t the ten percent number was one that I first heard uh, said by the Secretary General at his March 31st high level meeting on uh, the Syrian refugee crisis and on alternative uh, means of resettlement, and and that's what he stated should be the goal. It's not, uh, I guess there's nothing magical about 10 percent per se, but as I said, the, the current number is about 1 percent of refugees are resettled, which is not enough to have an impact on using resettlement strategically to alleviate, uh, to alleviate the number of refugees in any given host country. Um, 
by 10 percent, since, since many refugees, cri refugee crises are actually lasting far more than a decade. Um, that's the norm is now, as I said, about 17, 18 years for a refugee situation. Uh, if you resettle 10 percent a year, that will no longer be the case. Uh, you'll be able to resettle entire populations that need resettlement within the course of, of, a, of a decade if refugees cannot uh, repatriate uh, safely and, and go home. So 10 percent is just a, a – it's a number that's not unrealistic. Uh, with about, as I said, there are 65 million refugees and IDPs, um, but 10 percent of refugees would be a little over 2 million refugees per year uh, to be resettled worldwide. As we know, Germany has taken in about half that many in terms of asylum uh, – asylees over the last year. So it, it's certainly not an unrealistic number um, for, the, for the world to accomplish. It's – and it's a number that could actually make an impact. The um, – but in terms of what countries qualify or, or should be considered to be resettlement countries or what countries do not, um, that's a tougher question. It, it's obviously the, the industrialized countries have done it for a long, long time. Um, but, uh, but, but many other countries are also now – which are uh, – not quite at the same level of development as, as Western Europe or the United States are also uh, resettling refugees. Um, so it, it's basically – it's up to the country to decide what its, what its capacity could be. But, I mean, you do – I think your question also had to do with, like, the nature of the country. And I think you do see that the bigger resettlement countries are countries that have long histories of, of immigration. So it may take a little bit more to get countries that don't have the same experience with, with migration to do more on resettlement. But there's really no other option. I mean, the whole world needs to be part of this response. Hi. Good afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> My name is Shukumar Roy. I'm from Sangbad, Indian newspaper. Actually, I need to know, uh, could you a little bit clarify about asylum, especially political asylum? Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of uh, citizens from other countries came here different way. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we saw uh, around uh, 14 years, 15 years you know, boy, they are seeking political asylum. So what is the um, uh, criteria of that and how you look for that? Yeah. Well, I mean, so the, in the U.S., we – it's not – this is not a global way of looking at these things, but in the U.S., we differentiate, differ, differentiate between refugees and asylum seekers. And it's not who the people are and why they're fleeing is the same, but it's just how they get here. Refugees are people that we select abroad and bring here. Asylum pe seekers come to the border or come to an airport and ask for protection. So um, – and the criteria is the same. It's somebody who's fleeing or <coughs> had well, a well-founded fear of persecution based on race, religion, membership in a social group, political opinion, or nationality. So many children that are seeking asylum um, are pe persecuted or they, they have claims because they um, – they their families have been persecuted or they've been coerced into, um, you know, forced recruitment by the military or by gangs. I mean, they're, they're very complicated cases, but they're people who really do fear for their lives and, and really can't go home. Hi, my name is Mari. I work for Serbian newspaper. Uh, could you please clarify if people who are uh, uh, going through Europe and are on their way to Greece mostly uh, are migrants or refugees? Uh, yes, if you <laughs> can do that, please. And then can you – I understand from, from the, the paper you shared with us that you work in Greece, you have office presence in Greece. Can you please talk about the situation in the ground? Uh, I've just returned from Serbia. Situation looks pretty horrible to me. We see people, you know, walking mindlessly the streets of, like, the, the, the Balkans nations. Uh, it seems that there is no clear, um, clear idea from, you know, international community what to do with them. It seems that they, they themselves are not well informed. It seems that they are in dire need of everything. And it it's pretty much looks as a chaos to me. So if uh, – so the question is basically if they are migrants or refugees and if their destiny will be, be discussed in any way in the, those two summits. Thank you. I mean, there, there are certainly migrants and refugees, and that's why there's a, a system is needed to decide who are the migrants and who are the refugees. It's definitely a mixed flow that is entering Europe. 
And, and obviously the contest right now is what country makes that decision. And it's been Germany that's been uh, making that decision and, and, and Sweden uh, disproportionately, whereas the other countries tend to be uh, transit countries. But that's really, there's no question that, it, that it's a mixed flow. But under international uh, refugee law, you have to assume that they are refugees until you find otherwise if they are claiming asylum. And uh, so what, what um, HIAS is doing is our, our programs I are in Greece are limited to, limited to um, assisting asylum seekers apply for asylum so they do not get returned uh, to Turkey. Um, so uh, obviously the, the strategy of most asylum seekers was to leave Greece as quickly as possible and get to some other country in Europe where they want to apply for refugee status. Um, but now that refugees are, have to apply for asylum in Greece, um, HIAS is assisting them with that. But the fact that um, families, children are wandering around the Balkans without a house or, you know, someplace to stay and no, I mean, these are the most basic, I mean, really school and work. I mean, you cannot be secure anywhere unless your kids are in school. I mean, we all know this. <laughs> we all feel that we're all human beings. Your kids are in school and you have access to work. The fact that the international community hasn't figured out a way to do that um, is really shameful. So we're hoping that maybe out of this, the fact that there is a lot of attention to this, maybe there'll be some more resources to at least get people some shelter. Um, that's the most basic, right? Um, and then, you know, work on developing an asylum system that can adjudicate these cases quickly so that people can get on with their lives. Either they're going to be protected and be able to be resettled in Europe or wh wherever that may be, or they'll, they'll go back if they're migrants and, and figure out what to do next. But this scenario is, is not sustainable. Mark, from the presentation, we understand that you led the transformation of HIAS from Jewish, let's say, small organization to uh, global agency. But again, Jewish today is pro-Israeli, and I'm quite sure that the pro problem of Palestinian, Palestinian uh, refugees uh, is very well known for you and uh, for HIAS. Why you decide to go so high level? and not focus it, for example, on the Middle East, because the solution of uh, refugee crisis in the Middle East will help to Israel and helpful to other kind of sites. Yeah, that, that obviously is a very difficult um, but, but good question. But the honest answer is, and, and the reason why we really cherish the Refugee Convention, is that the Refugee Convention actually is, uh, is to find solutions for refugees. The uh, refugees, the, the um, Arabs who were displaced uh, it, uh, in, in, during the middle, in, the, in the Middle East, uh, when Israel was established in 1948, they have been written out of the Refugee Convention. I mean, they are uh, not protected by the Refugee Convention. Uh, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees uh, does not have a mandate over them. UNRWA has the mandate over them. And there literally is no solution for them in international law. It's, it, it requires a political solution. Um, so that's, that's a problem, uh, but HIAS is a legal protection agency, so we advocate for the legal rights of refugees. Uh, what's needed in that case, of course, is a political solution. Um, but they are counted in the statistics that we give when we say there are 65.5 million refugees, you know, nearly um, 5 million of those are, are refugees who are um, Palestinian. Any last questions? When we talk about the refugee crisis right now, we talk a lot about Syria. Uh, but I was wondering what other critical regions are not on spotlight nowadays? Um, Africa remains, uh, has long been the, uh, the largest uh, source of refugees and the largest uh, a uh, number of refugees are also hosted within African countries. The, the top three refugee crises right now are, in terms of their numbers, are Syria, of course, and followed by Afghanistan, followed by Somalia, which has just been an absolutely um, intractable refugee crisis with over one million uh, Somalis displaced over going over multiple uh, generations. Um, and then, of course, uh, but, but no continent is, is exempt uh, from large. There continue to be large numbers of refugees from, uh, from Burma. 
um, large numbers of refugees uh, from from Colombia who hopefully will uh, be able to go home at at some point in in uh, the not too distant future. Um, but those those are the major. Crises. And one of the problems is that with all the focus on Syria, which is appropriate, some of these other crises have been lost. So funding, international funding for refugee crises in Africa is way below the amount of funding that's given towards refugees from Syria. So th those crises are very, very underfunded because countries are really focused on, you know, the crisis that's in the news. So that's a problem. And the other thing I do want to point out is that the U.S. does resettle, um, I think it's 20... 22, over 20,000 refugees from Africa. So it's not just, I mean, sometimes people think refugees, resettlement, they take, think Syria because that's what's in the news, but we have a long history of, of resettling Congolese and Somalis and Ethiopians and others um, in Africa. Uh, hi, my name is Natalia Guerrero. I work for BBC. Um, I want to know more about your specific task as one of the nine or organizations that works resetting people in the United States. Uh, I want to know that same number for Latin Americans, refugees from Latin America uh, in the U.S. And I want to know how does it work, um, your job with the U.S. government? How, how, did you, how do you mm -hmm. develop the resettlement? Um, sure. So, I mean, the way it works is that um, the U.S. government the president every year will decide how many refugees that the U.S. is going to take. Um, that's in consultation with Congress, but it's a decision that the president can make. Of course, the Congress has to fund those operations. So that's, you know, that's another challenge for advocacy to make sure that there's sufficient funding. And, you know, we really are kind of facing a potential crisis starting October 1st. Um, in terms of funding for refugees. So, but the number set by the president, um, the State Department decides who, where the refugees are going to come from for the resettlement pipeline, they call it. And then, um, you know, extensive security screenings, interviews by Homeland Security officers. There's many, many steps that take usually between 18 and 24 months for a refugee to be referred by the UNHCR to the U.S. and then to be processed for resettlement. So that's um, mostly government work, and then there are some organizations that act as intermediaries to get do some interviews and gather documents and things like that. And then um, we actually, the nine resettlement agencies, most, most of which are faith-based, some are humanitarian, but the Catholic Church is the largest, you know, we're the Jewish organization, there's the evangelicals do resettlement, um, there's a number of organizations that, um, that actually receive and welcome those refugees when they get to the U.S. So we are nine national agencies, but we have affiliates in uh, collectively over 350 across the country in almost every state, I think with the exception of maybe Wyoming. Um, where refugees go, and either they join family, or if they don't have family here, they're placed. They don't really get to decide. They may be a Cuban that ends up in uh, North Dakota. You know, it's, it's kind of not up to them, um, at least in the initial period. And then they get some minimal assistance, really, at the beginning. Um, but then, really, they're expected to, you know, make their way. Um, but that's how it works. In terms of Latin America, we do a small amount of resettlement from Colombia, uh, uh, Colombian refugees who have, are in the region, um, not out of Colombia, but are in Ecuador and other places. Um, but that's a pretty small number. Um, we also have a program, it's called the CAM program for Central American minors who have relatives here in legal status as a, a mechanism to get them to be able to come here. Um, after the big influx in 2014, this system was set up. It's still very small, but it's, it's going to grow. But most of the um, people that migrants who come to the to the U.S. from Latin America either come through other means, um, through family or through work, or they seek asylum um, at the southern border. So that's really the northern triangle. Most people come and seek asylum. Me again, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, in face of the increase of right-wing governments and with the possible victory of Trump in the U.S., are you optimistic? Um, we have to be optimistic. We're advocates, <laughs> so we couldn't keep doing what we're doing unless we were optimistic. It's, um, it's very worrisome, to be clear. Um, you know, some of the things, uh, the rhetoric, um, you know, it, it, and we know because we resettle people here that they are also afraid because they hear the same things that everybody else hears. And, um, you know, uh, 
we have people in this country that are worried, you know, am I going to get deported? Am I going to be able to, you know, uh, refugee kids who are w wondering, like, how, how am I going to be received when I get to the U.S.? Are people not going to like me? Are they going to, you know, they're going to try to kick me out? But the reality that we see, and, you know, this is obviously in our world, is that people just want to help. We've gotten tens of thousands of calls since Alan Kurdi was found on that beach last summer of people, not just in the Jewish community, but our colleagues and all of the other agencies, probably collectively over 100,000 calls of people who, oh, can I have a Syrian family in my basement? You know, oh, I have a couch. Where can I bring my couch? I mean, people really want to help. And um, I think ultimately, because I am optimistic that that will prevail, um, but we're in a very difficult political moment. So we'll just have to um, see. You know, we're, we have a very pivotal election coming up, um, and we'll see where we go from there. Yeah, it, 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 one thing that does give us optimism is that heads of state are, are putting themselves out there and standing up for refugees on September 19th and September 20th. Uh, we'll see how that goes, but it's a very good sign that they are doing that, which shows that there is a, a willingness to take political risk and to respond to the needs that are out there for refugees. Taking refugees has never been something that is political, politically popular. But it is something that takes uh, some degree of, of courage uh, to do the right thing, and we're hoping that's where um, that's where the countries will go, in spite of populist sentiments that may be pointing in the other direction. Um, I asked our rabbi, one of the rabbis that works for Hayas, um, for some you know, biblical. I'm not a rabbi, but to, for some information, you know, just some. I was speaking at a religious you know, interfaith event. And one of the things she said to me, which really struck me is, you know, we say a, a lot that welcoming, to, you know, welcome the stranger is mentioned in the Bible 36 times more than anything else. I mean, and so the question is, well, why? Why is that mentioned 36 times? And one of the interpretations is that it's mentioned so many times because it is so hard, because it's easy for us to forget, it's easy for us not to do. So that for that reason, we are always have to be reminded that this is, this is our role on this planet, is to welcome the stranger. So that, you know, that gives us some cause for optimism, I hope. Mitch, why you say typical election? What's that? Why you say typical election? This election is typical election. No, I didn't. You, you said, no, pivotal, pivotal, important. <laughs> not typical. Yeah, not, not typical. <laughs> We're going to take one final question. Okay, in a, in a way, uh, circling back to the very first question that we, that we, that we hear, uh, how, will we, how are you going to uh, concretely advocate for, 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 for folks from Syria? Like, what concretely are you going to say to, to, at, at those two summits? Mm -hmm. Because you mentioned uh, new approaches, you mentioned novel, novel things, but we didn't really hear mm -hmm. anything, um, you know, particularly new. Mm -hmm. What will you tell them? Well, I mean, our, our, our biggest focus is that the refugees are going to come, whether you invite them to come or not. And to live up to that commitment of resettling 10 percent of the refugees is something that Europe and the United States and Canada have just, have just got to do, because the refugees will vote with their feet themselves and, and self-select if that's, if that's not done. And the other thing is just a, a massive amount of investment of assistance needs to go to those countries that are hosting them in the region. Uh, it's, it's no coincidence that when the number of refugees uh, who were leaving Jordan to come to Europe last summer, that happened at the same time as the World Food Program cut uh, 350,000 of them off from food assistance. I mean, there needs to be a lot more assistance to keep refugees safe where they are. And this is an extraordinary crisis that really requires an extraordinary response, not business as usual. And that's really what we've been seeing, is just kind of business as usual, giving a little bit extra for a refugee crisis that is the hugest that we've seen in, in 70 years. Well, Mark and Melanie, thank you so much for coming today. Thank, thank you, you all for coming for the briefing. Um, we'll be sending around the transcript afterwards, and you can keep an eye out for them next week if you're going to be at the Refugee Summit over at the UN. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.